Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's very exciting times uh, as an architect today. And I think if we reflect back over the last part of the uh, 20th century, um, it seems like there was enough money, enough ego, and an abundance of technology where we could almost do anything that we're asked or anybody dreamed of. I think the issue in today's, is, today's question is, what has it done for, for humanity? And what, what has been the impact on the ec economic, the ecological, the cultural, and the social aspects of our world? And I think those are meaningful questions that we're now looking at ourselves. I think today, what I want to talk about today is a little bit about the journey of how did we arrive here today? What, what's the context we're in? And what is the solutions for the future? And I'm going to talk a little bit about a call for a bit more intelligent architecture that's tied more to place, to more to the context and the ecologies and the energies of the environment. And it has a lot to do with how we've evolved through uh, the sort of pre-industrial times through industrial times. And I think if you look at the first image up here, it's an, out, it's a, it's, it's an image from space of uh, the man-made archipelago off of the coast of Dubai. You may know of it. One's, one, one group of islands is called the world. The other group of islands is called the palm. And it's amazing that we can build such a place for the wealthy so that they have more frontage for their villas uh, on the water. The question is, should we be doing this? Does this make sense? And what we're doing in our capabilities and use of technology, are we coexisting within the environment the way we should? And I think the question is, probably not. Um, if you also put in the context of where we are today as designers, uh, we, like everybody, are starting to rethink ourselves in terms of the work we do and the impact that it's having on the environment. We realize with the, uh, in the midst of the economic downturn, we have to ask ourselves, how can we reduce our, our reliance on fossil fuels? How can we question what our needs are versus desires? And I think the whole world is asking that of themselves. Uh, not just because we can, but what do we need to do to be a more sustainable world that we live in? If we step back and look at where we've come from, uh, when, we, when we see that we've evolved from an agrarian society and through into the industrialization period, there is a recognition that the uh, economic and social well-being of the majority of people in the developing world was raised quite high. I think we recognize that. But for some reason, we were unable to understand that we, we couldn't use all of our natural resources and they weren't, there, uh, they weren't there for our using and it was at peril that we started to overuse them. And I think we have to look at the impacts of that when we ask the, the current questions that we're dealing with in today's day. I think another example, not to pick on Dubai, but I think as architects and designers and doing buildings, we have the abilities to overcome the natural energies of our environment. If you look at the image on the slide, to have a ski hill in the middle of the desert, it sort of defies reason, I think, to most of us. But we, we can pour and we can defy the energies by overcoming it with the technologies that we have. But I think the real question is, can we sustain this from an energy and an ecological point of view, but also can we sustain a non-authentic experience, a non-authentic building and a non-authentic architecture? I mean, really, are these people really skiing? I think they have the skiing experience, but they're not in the open air. They're not getting the re real experience. And I think as designers and architects, we have to ask ourselves, does this make sense today? A little bit about where I was educated here in the years I was educated. I was educated in the 80s, and I would say it was in the downstream end of the international style and the modern movement, where uh, industrialization impacted building design. Everybody has seen these faceless towers all across the world, the ones that were heightened to be machines for living, when I think we realize as, as human beings we don't live in machines, we don't make sense in machines. And how could we um, I think this is a valid approach to architecture when really what we did is we figured out how to overcome the natural energies of our environment. We could build a glass tower in any environment, in any city, in any climate. We could orientate it south, north, west. All we did was add more cool air or more hot air to try to overcome the natural energies. And what I'm talking about where we go from intelligent point of view is something that is more homogeneous and, more, and coexists a little bit better. Unfortunately, I was also studying architecture when the postmodern movement came in right after that, kind of counter to the international style in the modern movement, trying to recall the historical vocabulary of previous times. But again, it was architecture, in my opinion, that didn't have meaning, deep-rooted meaning to the essence of us as humanity and us as a, a developing world. So, so I think fast-forwarding to where we are today, I think we all recognize that as the slide depicts, that we've, as we've grown and as we've moved in from an industrial uh, uh, society, from industrialization into a consumer society, we've got very outlandish with what we will build for ourselves, the type of space we need, the type of materials that will move from one side of the world to the other. And we're doing it at the peril and the, and the contribution of great waste. 
This is a diagram that talks about the tons of waste New York City produces currently in, in the current period. And I think there's a call out right now that we have to rethink ourselves from a consumption and consumer society to one that looks at restoration and recovery. And as architects, we're looking at how we can design buildings that not only draw upon the resources, but we're, our, our movement now is to, to go to a point where we can actually contribute back and create an e equitable ecological balance with, within the natural world. We also designed these faceless towers in the international style that became hermetic sealed environments that really harbored us away from the natural environment. So we could coexist without light, air, without sounds, without smells. And I think we all accepted it. And unfortunately, I think in modern times, there was, there was a, a carryover from industrialization that we should compartmentalize ourselves. Uh, if you look at the, the Dilbert world and, and, and then the image that's up front here, I mean, what we did is we brought people together, I would imagine, for collaboration and for uh, creating uh, uh, a collaboration and, and community together to share knowledge exchange. But we removed each other from, from one another. We removed ourselves from the natural environment. We removed ourselves from the natural air and the, really the natural energies of, of our world. And I think the reality of where we all work best is in a, in a natural environment. I think uh, this is where I'd like to work if I could, on my laptop, on a picnic table where I can smell, smell the air, I can listen to the wind, I can hear the birds overhead, and why can't we have that? Why can't we coexist in that type of environment? And what I would tell you is we can, no matter where we are. The other thing that's happened in the type of architecture that I do is buildings that are sealed up tight have become these, 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 these targets for, for biological terror and for physical destruction. And it's an issue that I think intelligent buildings can solve some of those problems as well, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. So, um, and how did we get to the point as the institution developed through the industrial times where we, when urbanization was occurring, we brought people together. Why, why do we have hospitals that are unhealthy? Why is there still hospital-acquired infection? It's not all building related. I know it has to do with clinical practice and everything, but I, 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 I would make a call to us as architects that we have the ability, if we go outside of our siloed profession, to solve some of these problems, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and I think if we step back, uh, William McDonough, who's the forefather of sustainable design in his book, Cradle to Cradle, he very much talks about stepping back and look at sort of the vernacular architecture and vernacular design that existed, where at one time we used to build, as he, as he uh, indicated here with the transatlantic sailboat, we used to build boats that were powered by the natural clean air technologies. We used to use the materials that were available on the coast of the waterways. And he contrasts that to that of the, of the steamship industrial times, which became a rusty, a, a rusty machine that polluted the water and used fossil fuels to fuel itself. So I think we can't just look at the emergence of technology as our solution. We need to step back and balance that with the opportunities ahead. Uh, oh, I just want to run back one. Thanks. Um, this is maybe a bit of a bit of stretch, but I, I, I did a contrast between the International Tower, which was based on proportion and beauty, and I, I created an analogy between that and a horse, which is beautiful as well, well proportioned. I think you can find it around the world. Um, and the reason I wanted to use that as an example, it has to do with where things are going. And, and the poor camel, interestingly enough, it's always been called the horse designed by committee. And I think what I would call to, out to you all is we need to design in committees. We need to design in collaboration. And I think if you strip back the layers of the camel and understand its physiology, it has adapted itself to live in its environment. It's brilliant. It is intelligent. And I think I'll talk about how our buildings can do the same. If, you know, the camel has long eyelashes to keep the sand out of its eyes. The camel has the ability to have selective brain cooling. The camel has the ability to control and manage and take in heat during the day, raise its body temperature to re-radiate it at night. And it's interesting when you talk that way, if I strip back the layers in the Manitoba Hydro building that we were involved in, and looking at the next uh, photograph, um, it's very much the same. It works on the same principles. If you look at it, it's got, a, it's got an architecture and it's got a, a morphology to it that's based on principles. The tower is a thermal mass where we use the radiation from our sun in Winnipeg, our, our beautiful cold blue sky days, and that then draws heat from the south side in these preheat chambers, which are atriums, that get pre-warmed up and get drawn through naturally through the, the principles of physics. We use the groundwater heat source. I think this, 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 this architecture has a physiology that coexists within our environment. It makes sense here. It might not make sense anywhere else. And it's not that, I, I call it an invisible intelligence because it's not to be overt that you have to see it because really what it's about is the humanity and the connection and relationship of the people working in the environment. Um, so if you look at one of those 
atriums. This atrium is a preheat chamber that war the air gets warmed up from the sun, but it's really a place for yoga, it's a place for collaboration and community to come together. So it's an invisible intelligence and I, 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 I think there's opportunity for us to do this in other building types. Um, this is our own office building where we said the world doesn't have to be in cellular prison-like cubicles. We need to coexist and collaborate with one another. We need to inf exchange information. We need to hear one another. And we can all have a democratic access to light and wind and nature. At the same time, it's okay for us to use the technologies of uh, uh, beacons on our building that will tell us when the windows should open, when the humidity and those conditions are correct to allow natural airflow. We can shut down our heating and cooling systems to reduce energy. So we can use high technology with common sense democracy to create buildings that coexist in their environment. Um, the other thing that is a major change for us and a, and a major call, we were all trained that we were the Renaissance men. We, it was our idea, it was our building, singular, not plural. And I think that has to change in the information age. There's so much specialist information out there, there's so much to draw upon, and we need to really get outside of the brackets of our silos. And I think the education that we received has to think that way. We need to start to work with one another and get broad perspectives and through deductive thinking and deductive questioning. This is the team that worked on Manitoba Hydro, taken in the double wall system, a photo one taken in the double wall system. This is how many people, whether it's specialized energy engineers, mechanical engineers, design architects, production architects, everything. Um, they all have to work together to produce intelligent architecture that I'm talking about. The other thing that really excites me um, as, a, as, as a, my involvement in the design of level four labs as well as hospital design, I had the opportunity to make a pitch towards a, 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 a test facility for DARPA. DARPA is the Defense Army Research Program in the United States. DARPA was responsible early on in the 70s for the development of the network system that we all know has turned into what is known as the internet today. DARPA right now is working on a program that we tried to get involved in, we didn't, but it's called the Immune Building Strategy. Its purpose is different from what I think is a lo its long-term future opportunities. Its current purpose is to see if it can detect microbes and disease that might be used in biological threat on buildings for government officials, embassies, and so on. It wants to be able to capture those microbes and hold it for evidence and or neutralize it. And what, what I think, I'm hoping, will happen is that someday this will be accessible to us for other building types such as hospitals. So my call is to go back to Think about the lessons learned. Think about hospital and medical environments as an example where it was a more domestic relationship between physician and, say, patient. Create a place where people matter. At the same time, we can, we can apply all these technologies, the science technology and medical technologies, but we need to humanize them. And I think if this is, uh, th this is a, a, a picture of, of, a, of a current room for the new women's hospital, we can have an environment that is serene, one that connects us with nature, one that gives us access to view, one that allows us to open windows to get air into it, and we can have the technologies behind it. So we, just like the atrium in Manitoba Hydro, someday I hope that the DARPA program in immune buildings will allow us to put technologies in here that will mitigate the, the issues that we currently deal with in hospital acquired infection and transmission. So you go in healthy, you get the critical care, you get the care with the, with the physicians and the technology that's personal with family, and we can coexist together, uh, I think, beautifully between the two. Um, and I think the big change in today that we didn't have in industrial times to understand what's the impact of our design decisions today has a lot to do with the software and the technologies. In our, in our, in our office, we find we can test anything. We can tell you how air is going to move through a building. We can tell you who's going to get what levels of sunshine and light uh, into the building. We can tell you what the patterns of, of uh, movement of people are going to be. We can test almost everything through software as, the, as we're using here, it's called building information modeling that we're using on the Canadian Museum of Human Rights. We have the ability to validate our, the decisions we make today on the future. And I think that has to do with energy, that has to do with light, air, all those things. So we have no excuses for the future. And I think that's what's really exciting and quite powerful for our future. And with that, and just in closing, um, I think if we move outside of our professional silos and we work collaboratively with other, other areas outside of design and architecture, I think we have the ability to solve big world issue problems that are A, balanced, of com have common sense, and they have purposeful technology. And with that, that's the hope for the future, and that's what keeps us going. Thank you.